Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I invite you to stand. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Greet each other in God's peace.
share this Easter proclamation together. The truth is, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. God is not irrelevant or uncaring. Jesus' victory over death changes everything. Because of the cross, we know that Jesus will never abandon us. We are forgiven. Because of the resurrection, we know that Jesus is alive. He promises that death has no hold over us. Real hope wells up inside us like a spring. Jesus says, I am with you always, and because I live, you will live also. Hallelujah and amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we glorify you. We praise you. We praise you that you conquered death, that you are no longer in the grave, that you are alive, and that you rose again nearly 2,000 years ago. And we've been proclaiming this. Our brothers and sisters have been proclaiming this for so long, and we continue to proclaim your resurrection power. Be with us today. Be with our brothers and sisters in Christ around this world as we all proclaim that Jesus is alive, that his resurrection makes the ultimate difference in our lives. Be with us as we hear your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. I have uh, surveyed the room, and I think there's uh, not enough kids here for a children's message. Maybe kids at heart, yes, but not enough kids here for a children's message. All right, was there a designated reader this morning? If not, I'll be the reader. It's not a problem. No, I can do it. All right, you still got me on mic? All right, here we go. Our first reading is in Exodus chapter 15. There we go. Thank you, Brandon. And uh, this Exodus 15, although you might scratch your head and say, mm, is this an Easter story? Um, it is a story of the, uh, just after they have gone through the, the waters of the Red Sea that have been parted. So the, the Israelites, with Moses uh, leading, and, well, actually he didn't lead. He, his hands were raised to keep the waters from uh, from crashing down upon them. Now they've passed through the waters and they've, they've gotten through what should have been death and they're on to life, if you get my drift. And let's, let me read this for you today about their, their praise to God after this experience. Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he's hurled into the sea. That's the Egyptians. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army is hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like a stubble. With the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue. I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword. My hand will destroy them. But you blew with their breath, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? I invite us to uh, read responsibly the Psalm 118, verses 19 to 29. Open for me the gates of righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in his hand, join the festal procession up, the, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Our second reading is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. With the imagery of Jesus, the Passover lamb, sacrificed, um, they also, Paul brings into that image the the what a difference kind of sense that Jesus makes in our life, like yeast in dough. So it says, don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading is in John's gospel today, John 20, 1 through 18. Early on, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go ahead and be seated. It's wonderful to be with you on this Easter morning. And I'll say again this proclamation, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, so in my message this morning, I just read for you in John 20, but also in my mind is also Mark chapter 16, 
which has a few differences. And I'm going to contrast those slight little differences in John's version and Mark's version of the resurrection because I enjoy sharing those with you. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you more about this. But in John 20, Mary Magdalene is present. In Mark's gospel, three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, most likely, and Salome are all mentioned. For them, it's been a difficult week. They likely, these women came into Jerusalem with Jesus and his other followers the previous, sum, that previous Sunday in sort of a humble parade. They saw Jesus throw over the tables in the temple. They shared a very hard-to-understand Passover meal with Jesus in the upper room where he spoke to them and said, This is my body, and this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And then they watched his trial they watched his crucifixion. He's nailed to the cross as he bled and suffered there. They even saw the spear wound to his side after his death. They watched as his body was removed from the cross and wrapped in a linen shroud and carried to the empty tomb and sealed inside. And then our story this morning begins, the Easter story begins as they continue to be of service to Jesus. John 20, it says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. So at the sunrise, she goes there, sees the stone rolled away from the entrance. She quickly returns to the other disciples, reports this. Then she comes back. Well, she must not have been running like Peter and John. And then the, she stands there in the garden crying. She knows what death is. She's dealt with death before. She knows what needs to be done. She has done it for others. The other women disciples probably also came back soon as well. They always focus on concrete tasks they need to perform, even thinking about the logistics of the entrance to the tomb, wondering who's going to roll back the stone. It is true for them that Jesus is probably not the very first person Mary, Mary Magdalene or Salome had watched die. Death itself is heartbreaking. It's terrible, sad and painful. But not surprising. Sometimes the timing and the circumstances of death can be surprising, but the fact of death is not surprising. We know death. We do not want to deal with death, but we know how to deal with death when we have to. Interestingly, in Mark's gospel, these women headed to the Jesus, to the tomb of Jesus at the sunrise. They're grieving but not disoriented. They're focused on the necessary tasks. It says in Mark's Gospel, they brought along more spices to put on the body of Jesus. They know the way to the tomb. They're working out, trying to find out how to move the stone. They look up and see the stone is gone in Mark's Gospel. It has been very, it's a very large stone. That surprises them. These differing versions between Mark's Gospel and John's Gospel, what we also find in Matthew and Luke, those differences don't bother me. They shouldn't bother you as well. They just emphasize different parts of the story of the same morning as they were experienced. Each gospel writer wants to emphasize different things, and so they include different parts of the story. In John's gospel, Mary, so full of grief, so emotional as she is there at the tomb's entrance, she has an encounter, and she, she is thinking she's encountering the gardener, she turns around. She's, he asks her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She's full of grief. She has lots of questions. She's never put into words. But interesting, Jesus comes and finds her. Jesus comes to her. That's the true good news. Jesus is seeking and finding. Jesus coming after each one of you, each one of, for me, searching for us to rescue us. Jesus comes after the ones who have lost their way. Ones who don't know how to get home anymore. Even for those who make themselves alienated from the Lord, even when we're far away, even when we don't miss him, certainly he misses us and he's on his way to find us. Our rebellious times, even when we've chosen unworthy living, Jesus is like the shepherd searching for the lost sheep, like the 
woman searching for the lost coin, like the father constantly searching the horizon for his lost prodigal son to return home, searching, searching, coming, coming, finding. These examples from Luke chapter 15. And what about that sheep that's lost? The lost sheep, what does he do? Just bleats out, find me, find me. And does nothing to bring about his own rescue. If in your spiritual life you have these tired moments, if your candle of faith not always burns brightly, you can be sure that Jesus is coming for you, that Jesus is searching for you. The truth is Jesus misses us, doesn't he? He wants us always back home. He will not stop searching for us till we are found and reunited with him. Isn't that such good news? On that morning in John's Gospel, it says Jesus is there. He speaks to her. She thinks he's the gardener. Mary doesn't recognize him. She begs to know where is the body of Jesus. And then he says her name. You could easily kind of gloss over that. But she hears her name. He says to her, her name, Mary. And in the hearing of her name, she knows and sees that it's him. She responds with her familiar teacher. He's called her by name. How sweet it is to hear your name, isn't it? Jesus instructs her to go find these other disciples, and he calls them his brothers. Not those guys that ran away. Not those guys that abandoned me. Go find my brothers. And so Mary returns and tells them the astonishing truth. I have seen the Lord. And that's the message of Jesus to his disciples. That they're his brothers. After the disciples had scattered. After Jesus was arrested in the garden. After they denied knowing him. Especially Peter. Three times denied Jesus. So many kinds of ugly failures they have accomplished. Yet Jesus wants to call them his brothers. They're not rejected. Oh, they're not the ones Jesus is ashamed of. Instead, instead of being undeserving, Jesus wonderfully welcomes them, loves them. And that's interesting. That's, that's purely good news, isn't it? It makes sense. God is that loving. God is that caring. But it would make sense that God would only be that loving and caring for other people who are loving and caring, right? But surprise, God's attitude towards all of us, all the time, no matter what our mood is, no matter how caring or loving we are in the moment, no matter how caring we have been in the past, God is loving us and caring for us, despite how repulsive we can be, selfish we can be, even lukewarm in faith we can be. Because God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Otherwise, if that was true, God would probably just reject us. But instead, God has great mercy on us, grace for us, treats us as his family, sends people to bring us good news. And that's exactly what Mary Magdalene did that day. She was the bearer of the good news, the first Easter preacher. It's amazing, isn't it? So what will I say? And to whom will I say it? What will each of you say to others about Jesus? Just like Mary at the tomb, we are also called to go and tell. Go where? Go to those who have not yet seen what you have seen. Tell them what? Well, a Lutheran Christian storyteller named Richard Swanson, I call him a storyteller because he is known to have memorized the, the entire book of Mark and share it in its entirety in about an hour and 15 minutes. Numerous, numerous, numerous times. That was part of what he did as a pastor and a preacher. He says that it's the Easter task, the Easter work, to tell the stories about the resurrection in a world where everyone dies. Tell stories about Easter, about the resurrection in a world where everyone dies. We can tell the resurrection story. 
We can also tell the stories of life that God has breathed into us, new life. Stories where hate is overcome by love, where violence is overcome by peace, where death is overcome by a resurrection life. We can tell the stories of how we experience God's everlasting life at work in us and how we see it at work in the world today. Those are the stories we can tell. Who do we tell them to? People that need to hear this good news. We tell it in what we say. We tell these stories in our writings. We tell these stories simply by living and acting with the God of love and peace and life working his ultimate power in us. We don't have the details exactly of how Mary Magdalene or the others that were at the tomb that early morning finally told the resurrection story. We don't know how many people they initially did tell. We don't know who those disciples told or how they told it. But we can say because of the women at the tomb, because of their willingness to take on an unexpected role, much like many of us, right? Because of her willingness to speak through her grief and confusion, then we can all share this Easter proclamation. Christ is risen! And to that, all God's people can say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand.
What a joy to proclaim together these great truths of Christian faith. Let us share these words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for all people today. Let us pray with each other. Let us join our hearts and our minds on this resurrection proclamation morning. Risen Lord Jesus, we come in prayer to you and thank you. Thank you for your suffering death on the cross which pays that price and your mighty resurrection that gives us the gift of new life. But Lord, sometimes we do have doubts. We ask you to forgive our doubts and pray that you renew our faith as we hear your word proclaimed and that we would read it and know it on a daily basis. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty, everlasting God, it is only through you, Lord Jesus, that we have the promise of eternal life. Help us to be assured that what Jesus has accomplished, we get to share in a great reunion of all believers in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, by your grace, we pray that you give the people of God wisdom and that we have continued freedom to share and preach your word where we live. And let that preaching give people great joy and increase their understanding. Deepen faith and bring new faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you are Lord of all nations, and you commanded us to go and make disciples among the peoples of the earth, among all the nations. Make us ready and willing to build upon the work of those who have come before us, and grant those who follow us to be able to build upon our work. We know there's always still more work ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the great physician. We take a few moments of silence now and pray silently for those who need your healing in mind and body and spirit. Oh Lord Jesus, help them to know that you love them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that you continue to teach us what to believe and what to do. Help us to keep your word in our hearts, that we might be strengthened in faith, transformed by your holiness, and receive your comfort in this life and even unto our death. To that, all God's people can say, amen. You may be seated. We'll collect the offering.
do invite you to stand if you're able. Remain seated if it's better for you. Let us share these words to prepare us that we are properly prepared and understand Holy Communion. Let us share the words together. Holy Communion is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, received in and under the earthly elements and instituted by Christ himself. The benefit of Holy Communion is pointed out in Christ's words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Through these words, the forgiveness of sin, life and salvation are given to us in the sacrament. For where there is forgiveness of sin, there is also reconciliation with God and with one another. Let us all come near to God and confess our sin and ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. The Lord is merciful and will keep his promise to forgive our sin. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I confess my sins, known and unknown, and my decisions to not follow where you are leading me. I believe that without your mercy I am lost. Please wash away all my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. Hear the good news. Jesus forgives you. God sent Jesus to us and his plan was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross for all our sins and then conquered death, giving those who believe in him everlasting life. Jesus continues to call the unbelieving to turn to him and repent and believe while there is still time. Amen to that. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. He said, When you eat this, remember all that I've done for you. And then again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. He said, When you drink this, remember all that I've done for you. I invite us to pray together as Jesus instructed us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The meal is prepared. You may be seated, and uh, ushers will be coming to uh, show you the way. Was there anybody designated to help this morning with the distribution? I need a couple volunteers that could help with the distribution. Kim and Renee, maybe? All right, very good. That's helpful. Thank you, thank you. It's okay. Sometimes we get more help. Sometimes we
let's switch to the song, Give Thanks. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace, now and into everlasting life. Amen. If we could stand for the give thanks and then the benediction and the final, final song. you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>